Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we're going to begin a little project, a series exploring Cult Divinity Lost. This will be part review, part how-to, or at least how I play it run Cult Divinity Lost. I've done a couple series like this before. My Call of Cthulhu one was nine episodes, plus one for Pulp Cthulhu, and then my Mongoose Traveler series was ten parts, plus another for ship construction, bringing that one up to eleven. This series I don't foresee is taking as long as either of those, though I still don't know how many episodes this was going to be, this is the introductory episode, giving more of a general overview of the game and how it works and really what Cult is about. I get a lot of requests for these multi-part review series, but these type of large projects I only reserve for games that I truly love and I love talking about and I love sharing, and Cult quickly became one of those games for me. Now, one thing, and like with my other two previous series that I'd done, I'm only going to cover the game's mechanics. World lore and mythology, uh, those are only going to be covered as far as what is absolutely necessary. Essentially, this series is going to be about the game mechanics and not the game world lore. Finally, before we get to all the fun stuff, this game, and therefore this video series, is for mature audiences only. It explores and focuses on a lot of dark subjects, which many people might not enjoy. This is definitely not a game for everybody. Okay, so disclaimers out of the way, let's get this show on the road. Starting with what is Cult? Well, Cult is a tabletop role-playing game first published in Sweden in 1991 before being translated into English. Cult Divinity Lost is the fourth edition of the game and published by Helmgast in 2018, and it has some incredible art. Mechanically, the current edition deviates from its predecessors quite a bit, which they used more uh, conventional RPG rules. Uh, this one opted instead to use a uh, variant of the Powered by the Apocalypse design, which is far more narrative and character-based, and is really outside my group's wheelhouse of uh, different ways that we've played games before, so this is a bit of a new experience for us. Now, I'd heard of Cult going all the way back to the 90s, but I didn't know anything about it other than just the name and that it was a horror game or what set it apart from other horror games. But then in October of 2020, I was doing a horror gaming panel with Petter Nalo, uh, Cult's creative director, and he offered me a copy to check out. I told him, sure, I'd love to check it out, but I wasn't going to review it until I had played the game and in order for it to impress me enough that I was going to play it, I'd have to think that it was a good fit for my players and I, so I couldn't even guarantee him a review. He said that he understood and he was willing to take that risk. So I got the core book having no idea what this game was about outside of it just being horror, and it absolutely blew me away. From the style and the art and the themes and even the lore. Normally I don't really care that much for RPG lore. I don't want to read a hundred pages worth of made-up game history in order to play a game. You know, it bores me to tears. I just want to play the game and I just read a bunch of made-up history lessons. So usually whenever I've got a new game, I just tend to ignore the lore or kind of just skim through it. And then as I start playing it, you know, we'll start slowly picking up a little bit more and more as we go. And then once I'm good and hooked and playing, I might go back and read and explore and learn everything about the lore and the history. But Cult is the only RPG that I have ever read where I was absolutely hooked on reading the lore from the very beginning. I devoured it. And I started hunting around around online and the other previous editions and different forums trying to learn as much about it as I could. What is Cult about? Well, Cult Divinity Lost is set in the present day and focuses on the occult and horror. Now, this might be survival horror, investigative horror, body horror, but what it really specializes in is personal horror and the supernatural. It pulls a great deal from the Kabbalah and Gnosticism. For those that don't know what that means, the concept is that eons ago, humans were gods, both beautiful and horrifying, and we lived in a great endless city as the masters of time and space. And then a being known as the Demiurg, who was maybe one of us or maybe some power from another realm, tricked humanity. The Demiurg created ten archons, each masters of a principle, and together they trapped humanity inside a prison, an illusion made of flesh and mortality known as Elysium, and what we think of today is the real world. Our jailers watch over us, keeping us blind to our own divinity and addicted to this veil stretched across our eyes and souls. We are born, we live, we die die and are reborn within this machine as our captors feed upon our power. But as the millennia have passed, the machine has begun to break down. The Demiurg vanished and the panicked Darkons it revolted and several dying in these revolts. Other powers, the counterpoints, the Demiurg and its ten Archons in Metropolis, which is Astaroth and the ten Death Angels down in Inferno, they began to wake and stir once the Demiurg was gone. Now these powers are twisted and as terrible as our captors are, possibly more twisted and terrible 
terrible than our captors, and they don't wish to free humanity but to possess the illusion that imprisons us so they can feed upon our power. The player characters are humans who have begun to awaken to this truth. They don't necessarily understand really what the truth is, they just know that something is off about this world the way that they've been told that it is. Now, they might see alleys that lead down into parts of the city that no one has ever explored, or hear the pain screams echoing up from a manhole, or even glimpse the inhuman monsters ruling our government, corporations, and religions, or even social media. Characters face off against cultists, fallen angels, demons, monsters, powers from other realms and other beings that are trapped in the illusion with us. Each character is flawed. They all have a dark secret they wish to keep and scars from all the uncounted reincarnations that mar their souls. The game focuses on the characters themselves, their relationships and their mundane lives, their fears and their hopes as they discover that everything that they've ever known is a lie. The air we breathe, the stars in the sky, the DNA in our cells is all an illusion to keep us imprisoned. And if any of that might sound a little bit familiar to you, it's because The Matrix is also based off of Gnostic ideas. In that movie, we have Neo, who's just become aware that the world isn't quite what it seems to be. He's trapped in an elaborate prison reality, his inhuman jailers and positions of authority over him, and he begins to embrace his true potential. There's even prophecy and reincarnation in it. So when comparing cult to various movies out there, aside from the obvious Matrix one that I just did, I usually compare cult to Constantine, and I'm a little bit more partial to the key Keanu Reeves' version of Constantine than the other ones. Uh, they live where our hero sees through the veil, realizing that our world is engineered to keep humanity enslaved. Silent Hill, well, not a really great movie, is a fantastic example of purgatories, and it's one I highly recommend if you want to see what purgatories and cults are like. And then Clive Barker's Lord of Illusion. And speaking of Clive Barker, there is of course Hellraiser, either the original or the brand new one. I've always been a huge fan of Barker and a Hellraiser series. You know, hell, one of the very first videos that I did on my channel was about my puzzle box collection, so I immediately gravitated to the world of cult. Well, enough about the world. Let's talk about the game itself. There are no character classes in Cult. There's uh, no leveling up in the conventional sense like you'd have in other games. There are four tiers of characters. Sleepers, Aware, Enlightened, and Awakened. Most characters will begin at the Aware tier, meaning that they've noticed that the world isn't quite what they thought it was. Now, for this, the game has offered us 20 Aware archetypes to choose from, such as the Academic, the Seeker, the Detective, the Occultist, the Deceiver, and the Ronin, as well as rules for making up your own archetypes if none of the ones that have been provided really fit what your character concept is. Each begins with a dark secret, two disadvantages, three advantages, and several relationships to various NPCs or even with the other player characters. Experience is earned more from roleplay and discovery than from overcoming monsters and bad guys. So as the characters advance, they begin getting you know, better stats, new special abilities, they might even be able to change their archetype to something else as their character is evolving, or they might just be able to ascend into the higher tier of character. The third tier, Enlightened, the characters have become incredibly powerful, wielding great power that's able to warp the illusion around them. They might be beyond the constraints of human lifespan, it's likely that they might not be fully human anymore. The final tier, Awakened, isn't considered playable. That is the goal of the game. It's at this point that the characters have ascended into gods. What do I need to play cult? Well, the only book that you need is the Cult Divinity Lost Core book. It's 370 pages. And this is the standard retail edition, but there are other versions with the cloth and leatherette covers. There's also the Enlightened Edition with the more explicit art that's not as retail friendly, and I can't fully trust YouTube not to get mad if I showed any of the art. There's even a small Bible version of the rule book, which doesn't have any art, but is very pretty and has these uh, little gold lined pages, just like you'd find in a Bible. Now, speaking of pages, the other other editions have my favorite easter egg that I've ever found in an RPG book. If you slide the pages just a little bit, a hidden message appears along their edge. Whichever version that you get of the rulebook is fine. Uh, the rules inside all of them are all the exact same. The only real difference is what the cover looks like or maybe how explicit the art is. All the versions come with a little coupon for a free PDF, which is nice, so wherever you get the hardback, it should have a PDF included. After the core book, you just need two 10-sided dice, or more specifically, your players need two 10-sided dice. At Game Masters, you don't roll any dice in Cult. The players simply roll their skill check, and depending on the result, they can get total success, 
partial success or success with complications or failure. And depending on the situation, even their own damage can be received for bad task rolls. Game masters merely interpret and educate the results to based off whatever the situation is. It's a style of gaming that took us a bit to get used to. My players and I, we all came as veterans of very crunchy games with a lot of little nitty details where all of us are rolling dice all the time. So Cult has been a bit of a learning curve for us as far as a different way of playing the game. Now one criticism that I do have of the core book is there isn't a sample adventure included. However, Helmgast also offers us uh, download PDF adventures for free off their website or off Drive-Thru RPG, which is awesome. And I have reviewed and run several of these adventures, so feel free to check those videos out for help on either running those scenarios or simply seeing what cult adventures are like. Also, there is a free quick start guide available. I'll post a link down in the video description below so you can try that out or maybe just follow along with the series as it goes on. Now, one subject I do want to address is the horror contract. As I said, Cult is for mature audiences and involves personal horror and uncomfortable situations. And that includes some really dark subjects and materials such as physical and emotional abuse, sex, and suicide, which a lot of gamers might not be that comfortable with during their game sessions. So in order to keep the game fun for everybody, and involved while still writing as close to that edge of our comfort zones without crossing that line into being uncomfortable, the game stresses what they call the horror contract as a means of encouraging open communication and trust. Now, this isn't like a little paragraph or side panel talking about consent and safety tools, but several pages dedicated to the subject, and it is regularly referenced in all the different cult material that's come out. Now, saying the game just has dark subject matter really doesn't give an impression of what I mean. A lot of people might get a different impression of what I'm talking about, so let me give you a couple examples from the core rulebook of situations that cult might present. You're held in place while the bookie you're in deep with undoes your pants and slips his rough fingers around your cock. He strokes it, almost tenderly grinning. When do I get my money, he asks, while the laughter rings in your ears. You feel like you can't control your own body. The lictor's commanding voice has entangled your mind. You feel your newborn son's soft, warm skin. You lift him up as he babbles and coos happily, unaware of what is about to transpire. You start walking toward the oven, your feet betraying you with every step. You wake up coughing. It's difficult to focus. Your vision and your face feel swollen and smashed. You're in fetal position on the bed of a cheap motel room. Hardcore porn is on the TV. There's a taste of semen in your mouth. The bed is drenched in blood. One of them got everything on camera. Now those are situations that a lot of gamers might not enjoy during their fun time game night. So to ensure that we don't push the story too far out of somebody's comfort zone where it's no longer enjoyable for them to play while also allowing to test the boundaries of what it is we enjoy, Cult emphasizes the horror contract, open communication, and any tools that your table might be able to use in order to aid that. I have read a lot of games that have mentioned safety and consent tools and honestly, it often feels a lot like lip service or even a little bit mug in its presentation. Cult, however, does not. It takes this very seriously, very adult, and I really, really appreciate their approach to this. From my own experience, Cult is the game that has challenged my comfort zones to run. We've played scenes that you know, normally in other games I'd have pulled the camera back on or shied away from before it got really intense and really uncomfortable, but because I have a group that has complete trust and open communication and my players are pushing me harder and harder this way, we have had some of the very best roles role play and intense emotional scenes, you know, things that I never thought us capable of before. So this game and the horror contract has allowed us to go deeper than we have ever been able to before, and I cannot praise it enough for that. Style and substance. Cult Divinity Lost Drip Style. Everything about it is designed to sell the mood of cult. Even when I opened up the book for the first time and I picked it up not knowing what this was about, after the table of contents, the next 28 pages are two page spreads showing an image and a simple line of text, building up the mood of the world before we even get to chapter one. It is powerfully effective. At least it was powerfully effective for me. Some people, they don't like that. I've seen complaints about it, complaints 
explaining how it takes up 28 pages at the beginning of the book. And I think that's something that might have bothered me in other games, but here I personally found it highly effective in setting the tone and kind of that mystery just right out the gate. I love it. However, there are some times where the rulebook focuses so much on the style that it kind of loses focus at clearly delivering the rules, making it tricky to navigate for a new user and difficult to use in-game. What I regularly refer to as being a great couch read versus a great table read. For example, because combat is downplayed as being just you know, simply another form of player action, there is no combat section in the book. However, because combat is not like any other action of the game, that means the rules for combat have been spread around to various areas instead of all being in you know, one easy to find and reference spot. The pros, while evocative, tend to get a little purple at times, especially in the lore section. I found myself having to go back and really look closely and pull out all the necessary details of all the various parts and the mythology all interconnect with one another, or ways that a game master can take these concepts that are very kind of philosophical and broad and give them a practical application into the game, because a lot of this game is written like a religious text. Monsters, which there are a lot of, are listed in the section for each of the planes and are not found at one central location, which makes kind of looking them up a bit tricky because first you have to find the plane that they're coming from or which one ever talked about in order to find the stats for this monster. And also, many of the monsters are merely described and have no listed stats, which I find very irritating. And while yes, we do get rules for creating creature stats, most of the monsters are going to have unique powers and damage thresholds, even between members of their own kind. So I'd like to have had a baseline to start with. And essentially, every Sephirim is unique, but I'd like to have had the stats for, you know, either a Sephirim that I can grab and go with if one suddenly pops up in a game and I hadn't been anticipating it, or as a starting point in order to customize my own. The stats for some of these creatures can also be found in various adventures out there, but I'd have liked to have had a dedicated monster section or a separate monster manual if a monster section had become too long that just had some baseline monsters that we could then customize even further. Now, the same thing goes for magic. Magic and cult isn't something that player characters regularly wield beyond what their archetype abilities might be. So there are magical abilities that they could have, but there really aren't spells that they're going to be casting. You know, Spells in this game are more in the form of elaborate rituals, requiring hours to cast, and you know, they have to you know, do a circle on the floor and make some sort of sacrifice in order to do it. But one possible advantage that a character can start with is what's called Dabbler in the Occult. And it says that you can perform or magic rituals, but we don't get any examples of magic rituals in the book as far as what those might look like or what they might be able to do. I have heard whisperings that there is going to be a coming magic book in the near future, but for the time being, we don't have one. And I really would have liked to have had some examples in the book of what these rituals are like, how to make our own, and really what the players should be able to expect if they want to do a ritual. Speaking of supplements, while the core book is all that you need to play, there is a good amount of support material that's out there for cult. We have a few adventure collections, one of which includes the Teroticum campaign, and there's also the Black Madonna campaign, which I really do want to be able to talk to my players into letting me run them through. It's kind of like, uh, this thing reads a lot like Hellraiser meets Atomic Blonde. And while it's not a Game Master's Guide in the conventional sense, because there's no rules that are given in it, Beyond Darkness and Madness is a fantastic guide to horror gaming. Easily the best that I've ever read on the subject. It is a bit dense, but I do really recommend this book for new horror game masters, because this thing's kind of like a master's class in being able to run horror games. Okay, so that is it for the intro portion. The next one in this series is going to be going over character creation, where we're going to make a character of our own, and I kind of walk you through that process. That's going to be followed on a video about game mechanics and combat, and yeah, I'm not really sure whatever else we're going to be covering. Uh, really just, you know, what else is going to get its own video versus what's going to be compressed down into, you know, different videos like that. And like I said, I don't really know how many videos this series is going to be. I'm also not going to be doing these all back to back to back, so this project is going to take several months to complete because I am going to be doing this between just various different videos or over topics. I have links down below for the free quick start, as well as the free adventures, as well as where you can purchase the book if you want to check any of that stuff out. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see any more of this series or any other of my game reviews or how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day.